Well, good morning. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at City Church. It's so good to see you, so good to be with you, um, those of you that are joining us online. And uh, before we begin, we are in a study in uh, Matthew chapter 5 uh, through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, as uh, Michelle read for us. Uh, but before we begin, I wanted to just share with you really briefly, um, I got to spend the most of this week, the beginning part of this week at least, um, at, with our church planning network. Some of you have heard about our network, Acts 29. That might be a new thing for some of you, and so I always like to just bring attention to that, that our church is a part of a network um, called Acts 29 that is a network of church plant church planting church plants. And so uh, we have a global network of over 700 churches all over the world um, that are bringing the gospel into their cities. And um, I spent the beginning part of this week uh, being a part of a team where we were assessing and evaluating uh, uh, families, men and women who have been called to go and plant new churches and um, got to spend specifically time with 10 couples that were uh, doing that. It was a great joy. And so before we begin our service time or this, this, this message, I wanted to just take a moment um, and just ask that we collectively bow our hearts together and pray uh, for the gospel to continue to go out and thank God for our network of churches, but then pray uh, for those churches and pray for those planters that are in the early stages. Many of you remember uh, when we were gathering in 2013 and early 2014 um, so that the Lord and just wrestling with God as he was calling us to this work that became City Church. And so you know uh, what that feels like. Um, If you weren't with us, then, then you're the benefactors of what God has done uh, through this church, um, which began so many years ago. And there's a lot of uh, individuals, pastors that are um, working through their plans and diligently seeking the Lord and asking him to go ahead of them in their work. And so um, as part of a network of uh, a family of churches, let's go to the Lord and just pray specifically uh, for these church plants. You don't know them by name, but you can just ask the Lord to continue to use them and give them wisdom um, and bless their plans and go ahead of them. And so let's ask the Lord to do that this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your work in our lives as we just prayed and thank you for, but uh, we specifically thank you for um, how you are building your kingdom in this world um, and that we get to be a small part um, of seeing your hand, um, taking the gospel, your good news to a lost and broken world. And we rejoice that that is true and that we can see that. I thank you that we have had the opportunity um, to just be a part, to just peer into um, these 10 planters' lives and their ministries. And this morning, Lord, we just collectively bow our hearts, humbly asking you um, to bless them, to be with them, to give them wisdom, to help them to be witnesses, to be salt and light in their communities. We pray that we will meet saints in heaven one day who are a part of these churches, who came to faith, who came to know you as Lord and Savior because of what you are doing in these days. And we thank you that we get to be a part of that. Help us to keep our minds and hearts attentive to your calling on our lives and um, uh, focused and just aware. Um, It's not all about us here (laughs) Um, at City Church or in Melissa and this community, but it's about what you are doing on a global scale, and um, we thank you that we can just have a chance to think about that, to consider that, and to lay um, these planters, these ministries at your feet and ask you to go ahead of them. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me in that. As I said, we are in a study in the Sermon on the Mount, and last week we concluded the first section of Jesus' teaching of the Beatitudes, um, verses 1 through 12, and are now picking up where Jesus is continuing. In the ending scene of the second greatest Marvel movie of all time, Iron Man, um, the world is watching as... Tony Stark holds a press conference, and at the ending scene, he's holding a press conference. Everything he has just battled, Iron Man has just had a great battle, and there's been all sorts of damage done. And so, of course, uh, those that don't want anyone to know about what's really happening in the world, the protective, the government is trying to protect. And so they've given Tony Stark an alibi and a message to give in this press conference of explaining his involvement in all that's been going on and who he is and what he's doing. And so he comes to the podium, a podium that looked just like this, very interesting. Some ways doesn't have a cross on the front, but a podium. He came to the podium and he begins to read his cards and he sort of gets off track as Tony Stark would do. And he lays the cards down and he says, The truth is, 
the truth is I am Iron Man. And of course, the, the, the press conference erupts and the movie comes to a close and we get to wait for the next installment. And the Beatitudes, we heard Jesus as he expounded upon the identifiers, those marks that make us Christians, that allow us or that would say to the world that I am a Christian. And we worked through those statements. We know that the world would, or we know that we would naturally never have become these things, but in Christ we have become them. And if you've missed that teaching, again, I'd encourage you, as I often do week after week, to go backwards. You can listen to our podcast and catch up on that. But the truth that we are Christians and we have a purpose, the truth is we are Christians and we have a purpose. And Jesus, now as he arrives, as he concluded the Beatitudes and makes this turn, he's going to get to the purpose, the purpose that we have in the world, to be salt and light, and in doing so to bring glory to God who, brought us, who made us alive in Christ. As Dr. Lloyd-Jones said, talking about this text, now having realized what we are, the Beatitudes, those statements of who we are, those identifiers, we must now go on to consider what we must be. Because of who we are, we are, we, we do things, we live things out. We know this to be true in almost all areas of our lives because I am a husband. I serve and love and care for Laurel in a certain way. I don't care for anyone else in the world like I do for her. I don't speak, I don't live life, do anything with her because she is differently than anyone else in the world. Because I'm a father. Grayson, Carson, and Hudson, I have a unique relationship with those three boys. I have friendships and relationships with other young men and students in our ministry, but those three have a specific, we have a specific type of relationship because I am their father. And so as Christians, we have roles that we play and there's different things, but we ultimately, when we consider who we are, we then have to realize there is something that we must be as a result of that. We live in this world. We've been raised to life in Christ, and so we know, Scripture tells us, that we're no longer of the world because we've been raised out of that. We've been raised to life from the death of this world into new life. But we do live in this world. Ultimately, though, we live differently because of who we are in Christ. We have a relationship with the world. We know the world. We have a relationship with others. We engage with them. And as we do that, we realize we come to an understanding of God's purpose for us, his good purpose for us. Because as we relate to others around us, as we be Christians, because we are Christians, the world has an interaction with God. They come face to face with God. That's why Jesus said to us, we are his body, the manifestation of him to a world. This is why, by the way, the Christian tendency, which we see in monasticism or monks, if you think of the monks and what you might imagine, even if you don't know any or have never seen them in you know, real life, this is why we pull, push back against the tendency of monasticism to withdraw from the world. We don't isolate ourselves from the world as a means of protection to sort of pull back. That's what they did, but that was not the biblical command. We don't isolate we are here to be Christians for a broken and lost world. First Peter says it this way, Peter, talking about our being Christians, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In our culture of self-everything and sort of pushing the, ourselves to the front of the world, sometimes we read this text, and this text is used in when we're feeling a little bit down and out, or we're feeling a little bit blue or sad about ourselves, a good friend might come to us and say, you're a chosen race, a royal priest or priestess to sort of lift us up. 
But when Peter says these words, what he's speaking to is not so that we would bolster ourselves up, so that we would think more highly of ourselves internally, but know that we would realize that we are called to be something in the world, that, that we are to live this out. So it's not for our own self-edification that we know that this is true. We are edified by this word and we are called to this word to live it out in the world. Jesus reminds us in this text that we are called out for a purpose. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. We are the salt of the earth. If we are not doing what we have been called to do, if we're not being who we are called to be, Jesus says we've lost our saltiness and have therefore become worthless to the world. But he has called us for a purpose, to bring value to the world, to do something in the world. And that's what we're going to consider this morning. What does Jesus say about this? As we said, there are some that relate to the world by withdrawing from it. Monasticism, the monks did that. They're even in modern day, they don't always look like monks, but they just isolate, pull back, spend no engagement with anyone else. There are some who relate to the world by seemingly immersing themselves in it. They're your friends that often tell you how often Jesus hung out with sinners, trying to get away with things. They have a push a little bit towards unholiness because, you know, there's everything is grace. And there are some who relate to the world, at least right now, somewhat politically or socially, believing that God's primary way of, of achieving his ends is by some political means or power. This is what the Pharisees did, by the way, to the Messiah. They thought the Messiah would come as a political power, and when he did it, they rejected him. But how are we to live these statements out? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does that look like? Well, as Jesus had defined what a Christian was, who they were, who we are in him, he then directly turns to our purpose and he says, you are the salt of the earth. The first implication that we can gain from this statement of Christ is that the world is rotten. The world is broken. When Jesus said this statement, he was saying as much about the world as he was about us. He was revealing the reality of the world in a way that Jesus perceived and understood more clearly than any other person who's ever walked the face of this earth. The reality that the world is rotten and is rotting. It's on a course of continual brokenness. That's what this world is. We shouldn't be shocked when we come face to face with this reality, when it hits our lives in a unique or different way that the world is broken. I know it seems like there's no way this could be true, but 2020 is more than likely, friends, not as bad as it gets. Because the world is on a continual decline. I remember one time I went camping and this was a trip where we parked our cars, gathered all of our gear, sort of walked in a ways and, it, and, and left all of our vehicles. And so we gather all of our stuff together. We get to, this, to the place where we're parking our cars. We gather all of our things together. We walk in and um, we set up camp. We get everything ready. You know, a number of hours has passed in this trip. And so it's time for dinner. And, um, and this evening we were going to use some potatoes and some hamburger meat. And you guys have maybe made that meal around a campfire. You shove all the meat in the, the potato. We'll give recipes later, but anyway, that's what we were doing. And so we get there and we start to make our dinner and recognize, realize, where's the meat? We've missed it. Something is missing here. We're looking all through our gear and trying to figure out where it happens. And we ultimately just, I don't know, we had to move on. So we had some dry potatoes that evening. Well, a few days later, as we make our way back to our vehicles, we hike out of camp. We come to our vehicles and we open up the back of the, the, one of the vehicles that we were in. And, and I see the cooler. And in slow motion, I realize the meat. As my friend begins to lift up the cooler to put all the drinks that were left over back, and I'm like, no. <laughs> he didn't realize the devastation that was about to come upon him when he opened that cooler. 
and saw the rotting meat. Smelled even before he saw, I promise you, the rotting meat. There were demons unleashed upon us when that cooler was opened. Without some form of preservation, this world is constantly on a decline, rotting away, brokenness. And as I said, we shouldn't be shocked by this. This is the reality. What should shock us, by the way, knowing that that is the truth, is that we are as good as we are. We have as much as we do have, realizing that we are in a reality of a broken world. Since the beginning, we've seen this continual spiral. Go back to the garden. We fo- the, Jesus, or God, creates the world, excuse me, and we're placed in the garden. Mankind is cre- uh, placed in the garden, falls into sin. So much sin that he has to destroy the world with a flood. Mankind gets a restart, starts to rebuild everything else, marching its way towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Devastation and evil and sin. God himself, Jesus, in the form of Christ, enters into our situation to the world. What do we do? We put him on a cross. Constant and continual decline. Because sinfulness is real. The world is rotten. Which is why Jesus used this illustration, used this word picture to give us our purpose. You, you and I, are the salt of the earth. We are unlike the world, completely other than the world, as defined by those statements, those statements of blessing that Jesus told us about who we are. You know that you can't preserve, if we take the illustration again of rotting meat, you don't preserve meat by placing more meat around it. That's not how meat would be preserved. You can't preserve meat with other meat. It's going to just all of it be polluted together. The world can't preserve the world. It can't create, so, uh, give a solution to this rotting, the brokenness of the world. We have to be completely different than the world because as salt, we are to preserve the world. And so we should examine our hearts and consider as we have this task, have this purpose of being the salt of the world, salt of the earth, the preservative of this broken world, the rotting and the decay that is in a constant state of happening as we live our lives and our lives are applied to the world in a sense, rubbed against the world. Does that yield a preservative? Does that turn the world? Does it slow the decline and the brokenness of the world? And if it doesn't, we should ask, are we marked by these previous statements that Jesus gave us in the Beatitudes. Do they define us? Again, we've said so often, we can't be Christians until we are Christians. Jesus said, this is what makes you, or this is how we understand and realize that we are Christians, the Beatitudes, and as Christians, now we can be Christians, and we can be the salt of the earth. And remember, you didn't make yourself a Christian. So often, we hear messages like this in somewhat calls to action, things that we should do, things that we should be, and we can begin to think that that's what makes us a Christian. No, God has made us a Christian. Only he can do that. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're only a citizen of the kingdom of heaven when God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, has allowed your heart to become so impoverished to recognize your need. To realize how destitute you are, spiritually speaking. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We only mourn sin when God has given us eyes to see within our own hearts our sinfulness. Again, consider your friends who are not Christian. If you don't have non-Christian friends, that's a place to start, by the way. That's a whole other message. This is about being salt. That's a part of how we do that. However, if we look at them, what, what is the preventive? They don't see sinfulness. They don't acknowledge the sin in their lives. They downplay it. They might think sometimes, morally speaking, I'm a little bit off basis, the morals of the world. But they don't apply, they don't think of it, they don't speak in terms of sinfulness. And yet we as Christians, we mourn our sin. And we are comforted by a Savior who is merciful and gracious. That's weird and strange to the world outside. But that's who we are. That's what Jesus says we are. We are people who can see our sin and grieve it. Leads to us being meek. Blessed are the meek, 
for they shall inherit the earth. We receive a humility. Again, all of these things, we recognize our need, which is why the fourth statement he said, blessed are those who thirst and hunger for righteousness. We begin to thirst and hunger for something we never could find from within, that we couldn't even find from without in the world. And we thirst and hunger for a righteousness that's in Christ. And so God did all of that work on your hearts and my heart. He did it all. But as he has done that, now there is this call to be, to be the preservative of the world, to protect the world in a sense. And so we have to ask, are we engaging with the world in such a way that we bring a holiness to it, a witness to it, do we have those non-Christian friends, those circles that we work, play, live in, and we use our, 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 see our purpose in life as we engage in those circles and in those relationships as being a preservative, as slowing down the decay? Have you ever been out and you've been having you know, a, a meal or had a friend over to the house and you've just heard their speech and heard their kind of talking about life and you're having a real conversation about really what's going on and you just see the decline in their life, the hopelessness in their life, the, the devastation and the rotting that's happening in their life and you say to yourself, let me apply my life to yours. Let me come alongside of you. Let me love you graciously as Christ loved me. Let me point you to the truth. Let me encourage you. Let me slow down and say, you shouldn't go there because there's something called holiness and is your life a testimony to that holiness so that as your life comes into contact with others, they see this difference? All of these things preserve and perhaps God would use as we be Christians, because we are Christians, to bring, bring salvation, to restore the rotting meat that's in the decay of the world. And we do that one life at a time. This is how we preserve the world. This is why, as we said, we should be shocked that things are not worse than they are, even considering 2020. And I know it's a crazy and a bad year. But things should be worse if not for God's mercy and his grace. And he has shown his mercy and his grace often as Christians live out our calling, our responsibility, our purpose to be salt, to preserve the world, to slow the decay. We also know what salt does is it brings flavor. I've got a good friend. He's an expert in meat. He lets me know, reminds me often to not put anything on meat other than salt and pepper. That's all it needs, he tells me. Now, I'm not trying to give you again, we're not doing a cooking class here. I know I've given two recipes already this morning, but that's not the point. But the salt brings out the flavor, allows the, the, the natural sort of whatever's in the meat to do what it does. And in the same way as Christians, we bring flavor to the world. We, we give a picture to the world of the joy that it is to follow Christ. How many people in our world think of Christians as boring, slow, dumb, incoherent, just some negative, just a malaise. They think of Christians in a way that is not at all who we are. And that's a false interpretation you know what the reality is? The world is going around because they are so bored, they look for something in everything. The world is so bored with itself that it's trying to find some fun, some joy, something to just give it a reason to pick its head up off the pillow every morning because there's nothing that the world has to offer. Meat can't preserve or can't bring flavor to other meat. There's salt involved. In the same way, we as Christians, we're called, we have a purpose to bring the beauty of this world, the joy of this world, the holiness, all that God created this world to be, he is enacting through us. We look for things, the world looks for things outside, looks for fun, entertainment, all of those sorts of things because the world is so bored with itself. We're called to be the flavor of the world, to bring flavor into our communities, into our relationships. We are the salt of the earth. 
Jesus says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? The answer is it can't. It can't be restored. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out. Jesus is saying if we're not who we are called to be, then our purpose, what he has created us to be, is being lost. We have a purpose. Yes, all of these statements of Christ defining who we are, they give us hope. They remind us of the comfort of Christ, the peace of Christ, our citizenship as sons and daughters in his kingdom. But they tell us why, that he gave us, that he created us, he has given us, called us to a purpose. We're to live in this world in such a way that we engage and that there is change affected through us. Again, we know we don't make the change happen. It's he does that through us. He's invited us in. Now you may be asking yourself, considering, well, how do we go about doing this? What is this supposed to look like? Well, the first thing is that we act. Now, when Jesus is speaking here, sometimes it can be confusing that we can think of the church as Christians and we can think corporately. There's always this tension within the Christian life about the body of Christ, the church, universally, not just the local church here as city church, but around the world, the corporate setting of the church or who we are as a collective group of followers. And then there's the individual. And in our church, we often say there's this sort of reciprocal statement that we say that we're never going to be anything corporately that we're not individually. And we're never going to be anything individually that we're not also corporately. And this this back and forth. Well, here, Jesus is speaking to us as individuals. We are salt of the earth individually. And we can do things corporately, of course, and we can speak into the culture. But again, we don't, as a group, we aren't able to affect the change that we would want to see happen, to be the preservative that we would want or to bring the flavor. We don't do that as well. That's not how we act and move. We do that individually as we engage with other individuals. That's the primary means with which we are the salt of the earth. So we come together again. We act often as a church. But here we're talking about what Jesus is speaking about is living life as Christians in relationship with other individuals. We don't preserve the world so much as a corporate body, but we do that as individuals. And so as we live our lives in relationship with other individuals... We're able to go about preserving it and bringing flavor to it. Again, we have to remind ourselves that this is not just some call to a universal action, but this is a call to a personal, an individual. We become poor in spirit as individuals. We don't do that collectively. Again, we're brought together into the church, but we do that individually. God moves on our hearts individually. We mourn our own sin. We become people who are merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers individually. And so Jesus is speaking here to the individual. Now, you might think of that as you hear this statement as far as how do Christians engage with the world and the world says so often to us that you might even begin to hear it that's why you should keep it to yourself see the world says I don't want to hear from the Christians right they don't want to hear our message they don't want to hear what we proclaim they don't want to hear any of that separation of church and state is proclaimed there's all sorts of things that the world throws at us to basically say you need to keep your faith keep your your everything about yourself to yourself. Don't allow that to ever creep out into the world. And you might hear, as Jesus, as we're talking, this is an individual thing, you might be thinking to yourself, oh, is that what that means? No, <laughs> that's not what that means at all. But what it does mean is that we don't act just as corporate groups, but we act as individuals and we engage in the world. And as individuals, our focus is on other individuals. This is why reciprocally, again, if we go back, we don't primarily engage other groups. We don't look at the world as a faction of people. 
This is the problem right now. The primary issue, really, when you get to the heart of the matter with why our country is so divided politically is that we have put everybody in a group and we've tried to engage each other as groups of people rather than engaging one another as individuals, one at a time, one heart, one life at a time. And what Jesus is saying to us is that we are the salt of the earth. We are to go into the world and engage with the world one heart at a time to live life in such a way that we preserve it, that we bring flavor to it. And so we engage our neighbor, our friend, our family member. And we do that as Christians, as people who are merciful, people with pure hearts, because our hearts have been cleansed of sin. We do that as peacemakers, bringing people together, looking for their good. And so as we are called to be the salt of the earth, we have to remember our purpose is to engage with other people. And sometimes we need to do that just one at a time. Some of us are gifted enough, we can do that two and three at a time. Not two and three at one setting, but I've got one, two, three, four. I've got a whole bevy of folks that I'm engaging with and trying to live my life with in such a way that I bring the light of the gospel. I bring these beatitudes to bear in their life. They see that holiness in me. Others, you might only be able to do that one at a time. That's okay. But be salt. Be who you're called to be with someone. Engage with someone. Finally, we act as individuals, but we also, what we act as and what we do is we preach the gospel. We don't preach, we don't command, we don't ask, we don't try and tell the world to take action. Because we remember that we took no action to become who we are. What we heard was the gospel. We heard that we were totally destitute in our sinfulness. That we had no hope to come to God on our own. We realize that in our own practice and hearts. In some way, the Holy Spirit of God revealed that to us. And when we understood that, we cried out to God. We began to hunger and thirst for his righteousness. And his Holy Spirit moved on our lives and gave us a new heart. And a new heart that is continually being transformed and grown and matured. And so that we pursue the things of Christ and we look more and more like Christ. We did none of that. We heard a message. And when we heard that message, whether that message was at a singular moment in time or perhaps over a season of time, a season of messages, we heard that message and Jesus gave us enough faith, just enough to believe it was true. And when we believed, we became Christians. And because now we are Christians, we be Christians. We proclaim the gospel to one another, to others in the world. We see the rotting and the dying and we tell the world we have hope for you. That's what it means to be salt to be the salt of the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we hear this calling upon our lives because of who you've made us to be. We thank you. We thank you, first of all, for bringing the message of the gospel to our hearts and ears. However you did it, we give you glory. We praise your name for your kindness to us. We didn't deserve that. We were like rotting meat in a cooler without hope. And you moved in our lives in such a way to awaken us, to raise us to life. And you've given us a purpose to be salt in the world, to preserve and bring flavor to this world. To slow the decay, you at work in us through your power, bringing hope. So we pray this morning, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to be who you've called us to be. We pray that you'd help us to proclaim a message not of works or of doing things, but of hope in you as we do that, and would you keep our attention 
not on groups of people, not on I, just factions and all of the sorts, not on political parties. But would you keep our hearts and minds attentive to that one, two or three individuals that you've brought us into relationship with so that we might be salt in their lives specifically, so that we might bring your holiness to bear in their lives. And would you just let the gospel continually be on our lips in all that we do. We pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. Well, thank you so much again for being with us this morning. I want to just make you aware of a few things uh, related to our church calendar and some things you want to be aware of for this week. First of all, tonight, very excited, tonight is community night. It's the fourth Sunday of the month, and so every fourth Sunday of the month is community night here at City Church. So this Sunday or this, this month, we are gathering back here um, for uh, some chili. Uh, some just fall fun. So kids, there will be uh, lots of stuff for your kiddos to do, painting pumpkins, there'll be some hay rides, we'll have chili in the cafe. And so bring a neighbor, bring a friend. If you uh, desire, you can bring a side or some sort of food item if you'd like to share with a group, but by all means, you do not have to. We have a team of people that have already rallied around this cause and this ministry to make sure everything is provided for you. So just show up. And I, I say this all the time, but Community Night is really intended as a place for us church uh, family to be on mission. So if you're joining us as a guest, uh, we want to invite you to come in if you're online this morning or here this morning with us. Um, but I, I really want to encourage us all to go knock on our neighbor's door and say, hey, come with me tonight. My church is having a little get together. And just uh, we want to create a safe place for the world to come and engage with us individually in a safe place for us as individuals to go up to our neighbors and invite them to join us. And so that's what Community Night's all about. That's the mission and purpose of Community Night. Um, but, but we want to be back here tonight at 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock. Um, come back with your friends. Um, you'll also, by the way, just get a chance to get to know one another. Some of you might want some new friendships here and just get to know other folks, and so that's a great place to do that. Also, next Sunday, weather permitting, we believe that it is going to be good weather, and we've talked about doing this uh, regularly. We're going to have another outdoor service, so we will gather outside. We'll have one outdoor service at 1030, so our 830 service, uh, you get to sleep in um, and uh, just come at 1030 outdoor, bring a lawn chair, uh, bring blankets, um, the because we do intend it'll be a little bit cooler weather, but it should still be uh, somewhat pleasant. We'll have coffee and donuts uh, outside. Um, uh, will be available for you. And then last, men, uh, we have our annual ski trip coming up Janu January 26th through the 30th. And so I want to invite you to be a part of that. It's a great time, a great trip, awesome time to get away. And um, I'll just share a quick testimony. This is going well over a decade back, the first time we ever did this ski trip and the reason that we, we do it here. Um, I was able to, to go and uh, we, we had this ski trip. We had a number of guys that had really never honestly spent time in Christian fellowship. They, they had, you know, they'd been on work trips and they'd been on trips with friends and, and their testimony to us was just how much fun they had, how much joy they experienced, the relationships that they felt. And it was unlike anything they'd ever experienced before out in the world because all of those trips, all of those relationships were so temporal. And they found like, they felt like there was some, some meaning to what they engaged in. So we ski and we have a lot of fun. But the, really the heart of this is that as brothers, as men, we could build bonds of fellowship and relationship and know that we have one another. And guys, we need that. And I'll be the first to tell you, I need that. I have men in this room and in other rooms around the country that are those brothers to me. And it's such a joy to be able to do that. So we want to invite you to come January 26th through the 30th, guys, be a part of the ski trip. So love you guys. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you back here tonight at 5 o'clock for community night. Don't forget, bring a friend. And uh, we'll see you then. God bless.